pinching yourself is no way to see if you're dreaming. Surgical instruments? Well, yes. But a mechanics kit is best of all. Edgeworks Entertainment presents... Short Transmissions. Stories to rocket you into space. space, 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 space. Tonight, The Tunnel Under the World by Frederick Pohl. Originally published in Galaxy Science Fiction, January 1955. Source, Gutenberg.org. On the morning of June 15th, Guy Buckhart woke up screaming out of a dream. It was more real than any dream he'd ever had in his life. He could still hear and feel the sharp, ripping metal explosion, the violent heave that had tossed him furiously out of bed, the searing wave of heat. He sat up convulsively and stared, not believing what he saw. The quiet room and the bright sunlight coming in the window. He croaked. Mary. His wife was not in the bed next to him. The covers were tumbled and awry as though she'd just left it. And the memory of the dream was so strong that instinctively he found himself searching the floor to see if the dream explosion had thrown her down. But she wasn't there. Of course she wasn't, he told himself. Looking at the familiar vanity and slipper chair, the uncracked window, the unbuckled wall, it had all only been a dream. Guy? His wife was calling him querulously from the foot of the stairs. Guy, dear, are, are you all right? He called weakly. Sure. There was a pause. Then Mary said doubtfully, Breakfast is ready. Uh, are you sure you're doing all right? I thought I heard you yelling. Burkhart said more confidently, I, I had a bad dream, honey. Be right down. In the shower, punching the lukewarm and cologne he favored, he told himself that it had been a beaut of a dream. Still, bad dreams weren't unusual, especially bad dreams about explosions. In the past thirty years of H-bomb jitters, who hadn't had a dream of explosions? Even Mary had dreamed of them, it turned out, for he started to tell her about the dream, but she cut him off. You did? Her voice was astonished. Why, dear... I dreamed the same thing. Well, almost the same thing. I didn't actually hear anything. I dreamed that something woke me up, and there was some sort of quick bang, and then something hit me on the head, and that, that was all. Was yours like that? Burkhart coughed. <clears throat> well, well, no, he said. Mary was not one of these strong-as-a-man, brave-as-a-tiger women. It was necessary, he thought, to tell her all the little details of the dream that made it seem so real. No need to mention the splintered ribs and the salt bubble in his throat and the agonized knowledge that that was his death. He said, maybe there was some kind of explosion downtown. Maybe we heard it and it started us dreaming. Mary reached over and patted his hand absently. Maybe, she agreed. It's almost half past eight, dear. Shouldn't you hurry? You don't want to be late to the office. He gulped his food and kissed her and rushed out not so much to be on time as to see if his guess had been right. But downtown Tylerton looked as it always had. Coming on to the bus, Burkhart watched critically out the window, seeking evidence of an explosion. There wasn't any. If anything, Tylerton looked better than it had ever had before. It was a beautiful, crisp day. The sky was cloudless. The buildings were clean and inviting. They had steam-blasted the power light building, the town's only skyscraper. That was the penalty of having Contro Chemical's main plant on the outskirts of town. The fumes from the Cascade stills left their mark on stone buildings. None of the usual crowd were on the bus, so there wasn't anyone Burkhart could ask about the explosion. And by the time he got out at the corner of Fifth and Lake, and the bus rolled away with the muted diesel moan, he'd pretty well convinced himself that it was all imagination. He stopped at the cigar stand in the lobby of his office building, but Ralph wasn't behind the counter. The man who sold him his pack of cigarettes was a stranger. "'Where's Mr. Stebbins?' Burkhart asked. The man said politely, "'Sick, sir. He'll be in tomorrow. A pack of Marlins today?' "'Chesterfields,' Burkhart corrected. "'Certainly, sir,' the man said. But what he took from the rack and slid across the counter was an unfamiliar green and yellow pack. Do try these, sir, he suggested. They contain an anti-cough factor. You ever notice how 
ordinary cigarettes make you choke every once in a while? Burkhart said suspiciously. I never heard of this brand. Of course not. There's something new. Burkhart hesitated, and the man said persuasively. Look, try them out at my risk. If you don't like them, bring back the empty pack, and I'll refund your money. Fair enough? Burkhart shrugged. How can I lose? But give me a pack of Chesterfields, too, will you? He opened the pack and lit one while he waited for the elevator. They weren't bad. He decided, though, he was suspicious of cigarettes that had the tobacco chemically treated in any way. But he didn't think much of Ralph's stand-in. It would raise hell with the trade at the cigar stand if the man tried to give every customer the same high-pressure sales talk. The elevator opened with a low-pitched sound of music. Burkhardt and two or three others got in, and he nodded to them as the door closed. The thread of music switched off, and the speaker in the ceiling of the cab began its usual commercials. No, not the usual commercials, Burkhardt realized. He had been exposed to the captive audience commercial so long that they hardly registered on the outer ear anymore. But what was coming from the recorded program in the basement of the building caught his attention. It wasn't merely that brands were mostly unfamiliar. It was a difference in pattern. There were jingles with an insistent, bouncy rhythm about soft drinks he'd never tasted. There was a rapid pattern dialogue between what sounded like two ten-year-old boys about a candy bar, followed by an authoritative bass rumble. Go right out and get delicious Choco Bite, and eat your tangy Choco Bite all up. There was a sobbing female whine. I wish I had a feckle freezer. I'd do anything for a feckle freezer. Burkhart reached his floor and left the elevator in the middle of the last one. It left him a little uneasy. The commercials were not for familiar brands. There was no feeling of use and custom to them. But the office was happily normal, except that Mr. Barth wasn't in. Miss Mitkin, yawning at the reception desk, didn't know exactly why. Oh, his home phone, that's all. He'll be in tomorrow. Maybe he went to the plant. It's right near his house. She looked indifferent. Yeah, a thought struck Burkhart. But today is June 15th. It's quarterly tax return day, and he has to sign the return. Miss Mitkin shrugged to indicate that this was Burkhart's problem, not hers. She returned to her nails. Thoroughly exasperated, Burkhart went to his desk. It wasn't that he couldn't sign the tax returns as well as Barth, he thought resentfully. It simply wasn't his job. That was all. It was a responsibility that Barth, as office manager for Contro Chemicals' downtown office, should have taken. He thought briefly of calling Barth at his home, or trying to reach him at the factory, but he gave up the idea quickly. He didn't really care for the people at the factory, and the less contact he had with them, the better. He had been to the factory once with Barth, and it had been a confusing and, in a way, frightening experience. Barring a handful of executives and engineers, there wasn't a soul in the factory, that is. Burkhart corrected himself, remembering what Barth had told him. Not a living soul. Just the machines. According to Barth, each machine was controlled by some sort of computer which reproduced, in its electronic snarl, the actual memory and mind of a human being. It was an unpleasant thought. Barth, laughing, had assured him that there was no Frankenstein business of robbing graveyards and implanting brains in machines. It was only a matter, he said, of transferring a man's habit patterns from brain cells to vacuum cells. It didn't hurt the man, and it didn't make the machine into a monster. But they made Burkhardt uncomfortable all the same. He put Barth and the factory and all of his other little irritations out of his mind and tackled the tax returns. It took him until noon to verify the figures, which Barth could have done out of his memory and his private ledger in ten minutes, Burkhardt resentfully reminded himself. He sealed them in an envelope and walked out to Miss Tinkin. Since Mr. Barth isn't here, we'd better go to lunch and shifts, he said. You can go first. Thanks, Miss Mitkin languidly took her bag out of her desk drawer and began to apply makeup. Burkhart offered her the envelope. Drop this in the mail for me, will you? Uh, w wait a minute. I wonder if I ought to phone Mr. Barth to make sure. Did his wife say whether he was able to take phone calls? Didn't say. Miss Mitkin blotted her lips carefully with a Kleenex. 
Wasn't his wife anyway. It was his daughter who called and left the message. The kid? Burkhart frowned. I thought she was away at school. She called, that's all I know. Burkhart went back to his office and stared distastefully at the unopened mail on his desk. He didn't like nightmares. They spoiled his whole day. He should have stayed in bed, like Barth. A funny thing happened on his way home. There was a disturbance at the corner where he usually caught his bus. Someone was screaming something about a new kind of deep freeze, so he walked in an extra block. He saw the bus coming and started to trot, but behind him, someone was calling his name. He looked over his shoulder. A small, harried-looking man was hurrying toward him. Burkhart hesitated and then recognized him. It was a casual acquaintance named Swanson. Burkhart sourly observed that he had already missed the bus. He said, Hello. Swanson's face was desperately eager. Burkhart? He asked inquiringly with an odd intensity. And then he just stood there, silently watching Burkhart's face, with his burning eagerness that dwindled to a faint hope and then died to a regret. He was searching for something, waiting for something, Burkhart thought. Whatever it was that he wanted, Burkhart didn't know how to supply it. Burkhart coughed and said again, <clears throat> Hello, Hello, Swanson. Swanson didn't even acknowledge the greeting. He merrily sighed a very deep sigh. Nothing doing, he mumbled apparently to himself. He nodded abstractly to Burkhart and turned away. Burkhart watched the slumped shoulders disappear in the crowd. It was an odd sort of day, he thought, and one he didn't much like. Things weren't going right. Riding home on the next bus, he brooded about it. It wasn't anything terrible or disastrous. It was something out of his experience entirely. You live your life like any man, and you form a network of impressions and reactions. You expect things. When you open your medicine chest, your razor is expected to be on the second shelf, and when you lock your front door, you expect to have to give it a slight extra tug to make it latch. It isn't the things that are right and perfect in your life that make it familiar. It is the things that are just a little bit wrong. The sticking latch, the light switch at the head of the stairs that needs an extra push because the spring is old and weak, the rug that unfailingly skids underfoot. It wasn't just that things were wrong with the pattern of Burkhart's life. It was that the wrong things were wrong. For instance, Barth hadn't come into the office, yet Barth always came in. Burkhart brooded about it through dinner. He brooded about it, despite his wife's attempts to interest him in a game of bridge with the neighbors, all through the evening. The neighbors were people he liked, Anne and Farley Dennerman. He'd known them all their lives. But they were odd and brooding, too, this night, and he barely listened to Dennerman's complaints about not being able to get food service for his wife's comments on the disgusting variety of television commercials they had these days. Burkhart was well on the way to setting an all-time record for continuous abstraction when, around midnight, with a suddenness that surprised him, he was strangely aware of it happening. He turned over in his bed, quickly and completely fell asleep. On the morning of June 15th, Burkhart woke up screaming. It was more real than any dream he'd ever had in his life. He could still hear the explosion, feel the blast that crushed him against that wall. It did not seem right that he should be sitting bolt upright in the bed and undisturbed in room. His wife came pattering up the stairs. Darling, she cried, what, what's the matter? He mumbled, nothing, bad dream. She relaxed, hand on heart. In an angry tone, she started to say, you gave me such a shock. But a noise from outside interrupted her. There was a wail of sirens and a clang of bells, and it was loud and shocking. The Burkharts stared at each other for a heartbeat, then hurried fearfully to the window. There were no rumbling fire engines in the street, only a small panel truck cruising slowly along. Flaring loud speaker horns crowned at the top. From the issue, the screaming sound of sirens growing in intensity mixed with the rumble of heavy-duty engines and the sounds of bells. It was a perfect record of 
fire engines arriving at four alarm blaze. Burkhart said in amazement, Mary, that, that's against the law. Do you know what they're doing? They're playing records of a fire. What, what are they up to? Maybe it's a practical joke, his wife offered. Joke? Waking up the whole neighborhood at six o'clock in the morning? He shook his head. The police will be here in ten minutes, he predicted. Wait and see. But the police weren't. Not in ten minutes, or at all. Whoever the pranksters in the car were, they apparently had a police permit for their games. The car took a position in the middle of the block and stood silent for a few minutes. Then there was a crackle from the speaker and a giant voice chanted, Feckle freezers, feckle freezers, gotta have a feckle freezer. Feckle, 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 feckle. It went on and on. Every house on the block had faces staring out of the windows by then. The voice was not merely loud, it was nearly deafening. Burkhart shouted to his wife over the uproar, what the hell is a feckled freezer? Some kind of freezer, I guess, dear, she shrieked back unhelpfully. Abruptly, the noise stopped and the truck stood silent. It was still misty morning. The sun's rays came horizontally across the rooftops. It was impossible to believe that a moment ago the silent block had been bellowing the name of a freezer. Ugh, a crazy advertising trick, Burkhart said bitterly. He yawned and turned away from the window. Might as well get dressed. I guess that's the end of... The bellow caught him from behind. It was almost like a hard slap on the ears. A harsh, sneering voice, louder than the archangel's trumpet howled. Have you got a freezer? It stinks. If it isn't a feckled freezer, it stinks. If it's a last year's feckled freezer, it stinks. Only this year's feckled freezer is any good at all. The voice screamed inarticulately with rage. I'm warning you. Get out and buy a feckle freezer right away. Hurry up. Hurry for feckle. Hurry for feckle. Hurry, 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 hurry. Feckle, 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 feckle. It stopped eventually. Burkhart licked his lips. He started to say to his wife, Maybe we ought to call the police about... When the speakers erupted again, it caught him off guard. It was intended to catch him off guard. It screamed, Feckle, 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 cheap freezers ruin your food. You'll get a sick and throw up. You'll get sick and die. Buy a feckle, 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 feckle. Ever take a piece of meat out of your freezer? You've got and see how rotten and moldy it is? Buy a feckle, feckle, feckle. Do you want to eat rotten, stinking food? Or do you want to wise up and buy a feckle, feckle, feckle? That did it. With fingers that kept stabbing the wrong holes, Burkhardt finally managed to dial the local police station. He got a busy signal. It was apparent that he was not the only one with the same idea. And while he was shaking, dialing again, the noise outside stopped. He looked out the window, and the truck was gone. Burkhardt loosened his tie and ordered another frosty flip from the waiter. If only they wouldn't keep the Crystal Cafe so hot. The new paint job searing reds and blinding yellows was bad enough, but someone seemed to have the delusion that this was January instead of June. The place was a good ten degrees warmer than outside. He swallowed the frosty flip in two gulps. It had a kind of peculiar flavor, he thought, but not bad. It certainly cooled you off, just as the waiter had promised. He reminded himself to pick up a carton of them on the way home. Mary might like them. She was always interested in something new. He stood up awkwardly as the girl came across the restaurant toward him. She was the most beautiful thing he'd ever seen in Tylerton. Chin height, honey blonde hair, and a figure that, well, it was all hers. There was no doubt in the world that the dress that clung to her was the only thing she wore. He felt as if he were blushing as she greeted him. Mr. Burkhart, the voice was like a distant tom-toms. It's wonderful of you to let me see you after this morning. He cleared his throat. <clears throat> not, not at all. Uh, won't you sit down, Miss... April Horn, she murmured, sitting down beside him, not where he had pointed on the other side of the table. Call me April, won't you? She was wearing some kind of perfume. Burkhart noted with what little of his mind was functioning at all. 
it didn't seem fair that she should be using perfume as well as everything else. I mean, he came to with a start and realized that the waiter was leaving with an order for filet mignons for two. Hey! Oh, please, Mr. Burkhart. Her shoulder was against his. Her face was turned to him. Her breath was warm. Her expression was tender and solicitous. This is all on the Feckle Corporation. Please, let me. It's the least they can do. He felt her hand burrowing into his pocket. I put the price of the meal into your pocket, she whispered conspiratorially. Please do that for me, won't you? I mean, I'd appreciate it if you'd pay the waiter. I'm... I'm old-fashioned about things like that. She smiled meltingly, then became mock businesslike. But you must take that money, she insisted. Why, you're letting Feckle off lightly if you do. You could sue them for every nickel they've got disturbing your sleep like that. With a dizzy feeling as though he'd just seen someone make a rabbit disappear into a top hat, he said, Why, it really wasn't so bad, huh, April. It was a little noisy, but... Oh, Mr. Burkhart. The blue eyes were wide and admiring. I knew you'd understand. It's just that... Well, it's such a wonderful freezer that some of the outside men get carried away, so to speak. As soon as the main office found out about what happened, they sent representatives around to every house on the block to apologize. Your wife told us where we could phone you, and I'm so very pleased that you were willing to let me have lunch with you so that I could apologize. Because truly, Mr. Burkhart, it is a fine, fine freezer. I shouldn't tell you this, but the blue eyes were shyly lowered. I'd do almost anything for Feckle Freezers. It's more than a job to me. She looked up. She was enchanting. I bet you think I'm silly, don't you? Burkhart coughed. <clears throat> well, I... Oh, you don't want to be unkind. She shook her head. No, don't pretend. You think it's silly. But really, Mr. Burkhart, you wouldn't think so if you knew more about the feckle. Let me just show you this little booklet. Burkhart got back from lunch a full hour late. It wasn't only the girl who delayed him. There had been a curious interview with a little man named Swanson, whom he barely knew, who had stopped him with desperate urgency on the street and then just left him cold. But it didn't matter much. Mr. Barth, for the first time since Burkhart had worked there, was out for the day, leaving Burkhart stuck with the quarterly tax returns. What did matter, though, was that somehow he had signed a purchase order for a 12-cubic-foot feckle freezer, upright model, self-defrosting, list price, $625, with a 10% discount. Because of that horrid affair this morning, Mr. Burkhart, she had said, and he wasn't sure how he was going to explain that to his wife. He needn't have worried. As he walked in the front door, his wife said almost immediately, I wonder if we can't afford a new freezer, dear. There was a man here to apologize about that noise, and, well, we got to talking, and she had signed a purchase order, too. It had been the damnedest day, Burkhart thought later, on his way to bed, but the day wasn't done with him yet. At the head of the stairs, the weakened spring in the electric light switch refused to click at all. He snapped it back and forth angrily and, of course, succeeded in drawing the tumbler out of its pins. The wire shorted and every light in the house went out. Damn, said Guy Burkhart. Fuse? His wife shrugged sleepily. Let it go till morning, dear. Burkhart shook his head. You go back to bed. I'll, I'll, be, I'll be right along. It wasn't so much that he cared about fixing the fuse, but he was too restless for sleep. He disconnected the bad switch with the screwdriver, stumbled down into the black kitchen, found the flashlight, and climbed gingerly down the cellar stairs. He located a spare fuse, pushed an empty trunk over to the fuse box to stand on, and twisted out the old fuse. When the new one was in, 
he heard the starting click and steady drone of the refrigerator in the kitchen overhead. He headed back to the steps and stopped. Where the old trunk had been, the cellar floor gleamed oddly bright. He inspected it in the flashlight beam. It was metal. Son of a gun, said Guy Burkhart. He shook his head unbelievingly. He peered closer, rubbed the edges of the metallic patch with his thumb, and acquired an annoying cut. The edges were sharp. The stained cement floor of the cellar was a thin shell. He found a hammer, cracked it off in a dozen spots. Everywhere was metal. The whole cellar was a copper box. Even the cement brick walls were false fronts over a metal sheath. Baffled, he attacked one of the foundation beams. That, at least, was real wood. He sucked his bleeding thumb and tried the base of the cellar stairs. Real wood. He chipped at the bricks under the oil burner. Real bricks. The retaining walls, the floor, they were faked. It was as though someone had shored up the house with a frame of metal and then laboriously concealed the evidence. The biggest surprise was the upside-down boat hole that blocked the rear half of the cellar, relic of a brief home workshop period that Burkhardt had gone through a couple of years before. From above, it looked perfectly normal. Inside, though, there should have been thwarts and seats and lockers. It was a mere tangle of braces, rough and unfinished. But I built that, Burkhardt exclaimed, forgetting his thumb. He leaned against the hole dizzily, trying to think this thing through. For reasons beyond his comprehension, someone had taken his boat and his cellar away, maybe his whole house, and, and then replaced them with a clever mock-up of the real thing. That's crazy, he said to the empty cellar. He stared around in the light of the flash, he whispered. What in the name of heaven would anybody do that for? Reason refused to answer. There wasn't any reasonable answer. For a long minutes, Burkhard contemplated the uncertain picture of his own sanity. He peered under the boat again, hoping to reassure himself that it was a mistake. Just his imagination, but the sloppy, unfinished bracing was unchanged. He crawled under for a better look, feeling the rough wood incredulously. Utterly impossible. He switched off the flashlight and started to wriggle out, but he didn't make it. And the moment between the command to his legs to move and the crawling out, he felt a sudden drain of weariness flooding through him. Consciousness went, not easily, but as though it were being taken away, and Guy Burkhart was asleep. Short Transmissions was created by Heather Johnson Yu, produced and edited by Rachel Emerson, music by Molly Walburn. Brought to you by Edgeworks Nebula. Tune in next week for the next episode of Short, Short, Short Transmission. Edgeworks Nebula.